Do you like garlic? Do you like mustard? Well, today you're in luck because we're learning about garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is a pesky weed with a two-in-one flavor combination. Its leaves and stalk have a wonderful aroma of garlic without even having to touch an allium. And of course, they're bringing the mustard family spice. They got a little bit of bitterness, but luckily today we're going to learn how to transform the always flavorful and occasionally bitter leaves of the garlic mustard through fermentation into a garlicky and mustardy sauerkraut. First, we'll encounter some garlic mustard in the wild. We'll learn about its life cycle, the things it likes to do, the places it likes to go, the plants it likes to crowd out, because let's be honest, garlic mustard has world domination on its mind. And then we will journey into the kitchen where we will learn about the art of fermentation. Please consult at least three ID manuals to verify that you have the correct plant or mushroom before consuming it. All right, garlic mustard is a shady lady. It likes to live in the shade of the forest, you're not gonna find it out in the heat. You're not gonna find it out where the sun is. It really likes to be beneath the trees, particularly in areas where it can crowd out other native wildflowers and plants, which it is infamous for doing. This very abundant plant or weed comes to us by the way of Europe and parts of Northwest Asia, and it is now found all over the United States. It's taken over the Eastern hardwood forest. It's hopping onto the Great Plains, it's making its way all over to the west. Luckily for us, it is chock full of nutrition. Garlic mustard has more vitamin A than spinach per weight, more vitamin C than oranges per weight, and it is a wonderful digestive stimulant. Now that I've got my botany bonnet on, let's get botanizing. Garlic mustard, also known as Oliaria petiolata, is a garlic flavored member of the mustard family. Typical to the mustard family, it's got a four-petaled flower with the petals kind of situated in a cross shape. And if you look really close, if you get out your little hand lens, if you get out your little microscope, if you take a peek, it's got four tall stamens and two shorter stamens by the side. That's how we know it's in the mustard family. If you find a garlic mustard plant, you can also crush the leaves and you'll smell the ooh. Mm, and you, you will smell the garlicky and mustardy flavors that, care, that give this plant its name. Garlic mustard is a biennial woodland herb, meaning that it has a two-year life cycle. So the first year, it's laying low. It's staying close to the ground, living it up in the shade. It forms a basal rosette of kidney-shaped leaves with scallop edges, and the leaves have longish leaf stalks that attach to a central point on the ground. That's what it means to be a basal rosette. The leaves are at the base, and they form a rosette pattern all coming out from one central point. Then on the second year, garlic mustard gets reproduction on its mind and it uses all the energy it stored up the first year to send up a stalk in the spring. And garlic mustard does a little bit of shape shifting. It gets a little tricky. It likes to mess with your ID. And so the leaves transform from these kidney shaped leaves at the bottom. As they go up the stalk, the leaf stalks get shorter and shorter and shorter as they go up to the top and the leaf shape changes from kidney to the ever more popular triangle or heart shaped leaves. Then the stalk itself, it goes straight up. It does a little bit of branching at the top, but it is not a big brancher. It's keeping the branching to a minimum. And up at the top, you'll see the tiny white flowers, the mustard family flowers. And these stalks will get about three feet high generally with garlic mustard. No lie, it's invasive, it's abundant, it's maybe thinking about taking over the world. It's hard to tell with plants sometimes, but you really should harvest your garlic mustard before it goes to seed. It'll form these seed pods that are a few inches long, very skinny, and that is how it's planning to take over the world. It's like seeds over here, seeds over there, seeds everywhere, and soon the whole world will be carpeted in garlic mustard, and that's all you'll be eating for the rest of your days. So if you see a garlic mustard in flower, snip it, harvest it, Maybe pull it up, do something about it, because garlic mustard is taken over. So for garlic mustard kraut, I really like to use the spring leaves, the early spring leaves, usually from the basil rosette. So that's the part that grows along the ground. Although leaves from the stalk and the flowering tops also work well. It just depends for what you're going with, if you're willing to like chop them up a little bit. So the thing with garlic mustard leaves is that 
they tend to be a little bit bitter, so when you're harvesting, just, just give them a little taste so you know what you're working with. And it's totally fine for them to be a little too bitter to be eaten raw, because through the magic of fermentation, they will be transformed. So it's not a huge deal if they're bitter. That's why we're making a crowd out of them because it's so magical and like a wonderful flavor transformer. I've used super bitter leaves before in this kraut and it's been totally fine. I've been shocked at like how mild and pleasant the sauerkraut turned out because we're using a smaller amount of leaves as a seasoning. We're not just fermenting them plain. As a side note, you can also make a really nice ferment from the flowering tops and just put them in a brine. So right now we're going to be making sauerkraut, which is a self-brining ferment, but you can make a brine out of salt and water and add the flowering tops to that. And they are a really beautiful garnish once you ferment them and very tasty. So as we get into the fermentation, I would like to note that there's many styles to ferment, uh, even just for a plain sauerkraut. There's anything from like a traditional crock, which has a water lock, um, to the more newfangled fermenting with a bag or even fermenting in a bag, in a vacuum sealed bag. So I encourage you to explore different ways to ferment. Fermentation should be easy and fun. And I encourage you to explore which method really resonates with you. Today, I'll be sharing my current favorite method, which is adapted from Pascal Baudard's book, Wild Fermentation, which is a really wonderful resource where basically it's a little bit looser version of a ferment. You have to really, you have to tend to it. You have to be willing to stir it, you know, one to three times a day, uh, which is something that I find works really well for me. Other people, they like to put a bag on it. So we're gonna take our garlic mustard leaves and we're gonna do something called a chiffonade, which is a really fancy term for like basically rolling them up into a little plant cigar, chopping them up super fine. And basically the reason that we do this is to release the flavor and also to, more importantly, to keep them from becoming really tough in the final ferment. You don't wanna go like chewing on and like gnawing on like a chunk of garlic mustard leaf, which like, can happen, so you know, we keep them nice and fine so that when they ferment, they're in just nice little tiny delicate strips. Um, and they look really beautiful in the jar, so that's a plus. So over here we have two ounces um, of garlic mustard leaves. This is about roughly two like really firmly packed cups for those of you who prefer to cook by volume instead of by weight. And we also have one pound of cabbage, so you can just weigh your cabbage beforehand. I usually like to take off the outer leaves because they can look a little bit funky and slice into quarters and then take out the core from each quarter. It can be really hard and tough and I personally prefer to take them out of my ferments, although of course they're edible. And if you don't mind that, you're welcome to leave them in. So we're just gonna chop that up, not super finely, you know, just do it according to your own preferences. If you're not sure what your preferences for kraut are yet, just go for like, you know, a medium slice. It's not really a big deal. This doesn't have to be very exact. And then as for salt, uh, we're just using 11 grams of sea salt and it's nice to weigh out your salt because there is a lot of variation across the board in salt types. If you're using a common table salt that'll be about roughly two teaspoons but depending on the flakiness of your salt, if it's really like dense black mattery salt, you're just gonna want to weigh it out. So if you're doing your salt by volume and not by weight, basically the kraut should taste a little too salty. You don't want to end up with a kraut that is not salty enough because the salt is what keeps the bad guys at bay. And then as our last ingredient, we're gonna be using one tablespoon of curry powder. This is completely optional. Um, I personally prefer this ferment with the curry powder because I really like the flavor. If you just really wanna celebrate the flavor of the garlic mustard, you can totally leave it out and your final ferment will taste, it'll taste pleasantly mustardy with a hint of garlic. If you really like actual garlic, you're welcome to dial it up, you know, throw some minced cloves in. Just a few though, because garlic does tend to get surprisingly strong when fermented over time. For today, I'll be demoing curried garlic mustard kraut for those who may be more hesitant about the flavor of the garlic mustard. Alrighty, next step, putting it all together, except for the curry powder. This is just a personal preference because I don't really like having curry stained hands. I like to save that part for the end, and we're gonna be doing a lot of like squishing of the cabbage, spoiler alert, so I like to keep the uh, curry to the end. So we're gonna take our cabbage, it's great to have it in a bigger bowl, one for room to like squish it. This is the biggest bowl I have, so we're gonna be doing the best we can. So first off, we are going to put our lovely chiffonade, this looks like gorgeous green hair, 
into our slightly less gorgeous but still just as lovely cabbage. So what we're doing here is breaking down the cell walls in the cabbage, releasing its sweet and salty cabbage tears, which we will then force it to bathe in for the rest of its short life. So this cabbage has been sitting on a shelf for years. Nobody loved it. No one came and visited it. It's been longing to be held and to be loved, just like us all. And now you're getting your hands on it. You're massaging this cabbage and it is in heaven. It is crying out these tears. The floodgate that has held back all of these cabbagey emotions for years has been busted open. And the tears are out. The tears are out. We're squeezing them out. They're, uh, everything is just, it's all coming out in one, one sweet cabbagey mess. So, you know, we're just going to keep, we're going to keep massaging this until the cabbage has no more tears left to cry. This usually takes about 10 minutes. So the lactobacteria, which we are trying to cultivate and harness for our own benefit, thrive upon sugars such as those of the tears of the cabbage, and they also flourish in a salty environment. So the lactobacteria, they eat up these cabbage tears, they're like, mm -mm, so good, we love these sweet tears, give us some more. In exchange for that, they will produce some lactic acid for you. And this lactic acid along with the salt will work, they will team up and they'll create an environment which is beneficial for themselves and which is detrimental to bad bacteria and molds. So this is basically like the principle of fermentation in a nutshell. And how we pack a jar for sauerkraut is we take a handful and then you can use a sauerkraut pounder, which is basically just like a fat stick that you put in a jar. Or you can use your own hand and you know, you kind of just press them down. The goal here is to prevent air pockets. So we're basically just like, we're smushing it down. All these lovely tears, this tear mixture, this brine at the bottom, we're gonna be pouring it on top. So that'll fill in some of the cracks, but really when we're putting them in, you just wanna like really pack it down as much as you can. All right, so we're gonna pour this lovely brine on top. You screw the lid on tight, but not too tight and send it off to bed. Once your kraut is in the jar, it's all tucked in. Uh, you know, the next day we're going to take it and we are going to give it a good stir. Mmm, smells crowdy. And then pack it down beneath the brine. And always, you know, always use a clean jar to pack it into and always use a clean fork when you're stirring it. Pack it down as, as best you can. Some of it's gonna poke up, but that's why we stir it one to three times a day for the first three to four days. And then once it's really cooking, you know, we put the lid back on, we're burping it once a day. And, uh, and after 10 to 14 days of initial, the primary fermentation should be done. So basically the lactic bacteria, they've eaten all the food, they've partied it up, party's over, the cops are here. And uh, you know, they're, they're slowly starving to death because there's no more food. And that's the time when you move that ferment into your fridge. And a few, a few stragglers are gonna remain. A few stragglers are still gonna be, you know, eaten in there. The fridge is basically a fermentation slower downer. <laughs> so it's not gonna halt fermentation, it's not gonna stop it, but it's really gonna like put a damper on the party. So you can store it there. It should be good for, you know, for months. You know, fermentation is a method, is primarily a method of food preservation. So, you know, pop this ferment into the fridge and, uh, and enjoy. Thanks for tuning in, and please let us know in the comments whether you prefer your garlic mustard sauerkraut curried or plain. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more flavorful foraging content featuring abundant and invasive plants. As always, happy foraging. Mm -hmm.